Hi, my name is Brooke and I'm an geologist. Today we're here in Headington in Oxfordshire at the Rock Edge Nature Reserve and we're going to look at some beautiful Middle Jurassic limestones. So even here in the middle of a city we've got some excellent geology. In fact this geology is so good it's a triple SI which is a site of special scientific interest because of the beautifully preserved rocks which preserve a Middle Jurassic black reef environment and because of the unique plants and animals that live around here. This is actually an old quarry, so this was dug out by people long ago in the 1800s. Actually, that's not that long, is it? I mean, it's long for people, but not for geology. And that's exposed this beautiful section of, of limestone here that we can have a look at. Let's get started. Geology is really cool. Let's go lick some logs. Yeah! So the first thing you probably notice about this rock is its yellow colour. And this comes from an iron oxyhydroxide called limonite. And that's what this yellow dust is over everything. And that tells us that there was a lot of iron in this rock. There's also a lot of a clay called kaolinite in here, which needs a lot of aluminium. So that tells us that we probably weren't too far from land. The other thing you're probably going to notice straight away is how knobbly and bumpy some parts of it are, but some parts of it look relatively smooth. And then it kind of divides up into these bits that stick out, these layers here that stick out, and then these layers in the background. In the background? <laughs> these other layers that kind of get eroded back. That tells us straight away that these different layers have different properties and might mean that they're made of different things. So let's have a close-up look and see what we can see in these different layers. So the first thing I've noticed is this little thing that looks like a dried bean. And this is quite interesting because this is an oyster shell. Not only that, it's an oyster shell that looks like it was broken open and then the creatures died and the shell sat on the seabed because it's got a little tiny worm tube on it and then the marks where other oysters have stuck on it. So this was sat on the sediment surface for quite some time for it to be recolonized. And that means we've actually got a quite a slow sedimentation rate. Oysters like a hard surface to sit on so that they can glue their shells to it and grow. And that means that we've got a very slow sedimentation rate and we've developed on the seabed what's called a hard ground. Let's see if we can find some more evidence for what kind of environment this is. Because oysters can, don't just live in seawater, but they also live in lagoonal and estuarine water as well. So when we get all right up close, we can see that there's lots of oyster shells. Some of them are laid down in beds, which are stuck together, cemented together. And then some of them are mixed up with all of this rubbly material and churned up with other shells. So we were looking for evidence of what kind of environment this is. And if we look up here on the underside of this bed and in the, the bits of rubble, we can actually see we've got these tubes, tubes, with all of these lines and striations on them. And some of the tubes have a nice pattern at the end that's been preserved. And those are corals. And this particular coral is a common middle Jurassic coral called Fecosmilia. So that means that we're definitely in a marine environment because corals don't live in fresh water or brackish water. So let's have a close up here and see what we can see, see if you can see any corals. So let's have a close up at these layers and see what evidence we can collect. We've got one of these rubbly layers above us and we can see that it's mostly made up of bits of oyster shell. And these oyster shells are covered in other oyster shells that had grown over them and then worm tubes. So they must have been sat on the bed, seabed when this is happening. These other big chunks are actually bits of coral. And Thecosmilia is a big chunky coral. It's hard because its skeleton is made of limestone. So it actually takes a lot of energy to smash that up. So there must have been big storms or wave, lots of wave energy. So maybe it's relatively shallow water in a tropical setting. There's lots of other shells smashed up in here as well. And then there's bits of this carbonate mud forming these little pelloids, these little pellets, which probably came out of the back end of animals and then got roll, rolled around on the seabed. Then we've got one of these muddy layers and then we can see that the mud is draping over the underlying rubbly layer. So that means that the conditions have become quieter and the mud was settling out and draping across it, like if you imagine a blanket draping across pillows. So we've had another change of environment there. And the water depth has probably become relatively deeper. 
We don't know if that means that the land here has gone down or if the overall sea level has gone up. We just know that there's been a relative change. And the fact that we've got all of these iron oxides and aluminium silicate clays means that we're, we're quite close to land, relatively close to now, land. And then we've got another rubbly layer. And so again, this is part of our reef complex, high energy environment, lots of storms, lots of big waves. And then there's some more clay. And then there's uh, this solid blocky layer of grey limestone, which is made up of bits of shells with mud between them, but lime mud, not silicate clay mud. And the shells here are different, not as many oysters, more things like cockles and snail shells. And that lime mud, if you think of like the Florida Keys, it just starts out as like a, a very fine grained gooey mud, and that's settling in between and everything. And then as it gets, as the mud gets buried, it forms a hard cement between the shells. So again, that's a third environment. We've got the rubbly high energy environment. We've got the silicate clay rich, low energy, lower energy environment. And then we've got the carbonate mud rich, low energy environment. So just in this small section of about a meter, we can see that there's a lot of environmental change. Something else that's interesting is in, the, in these blocky limestone beds is we see brachiopods, which look like clams, but they're a completely different organism. And brachiopods feed with a structure like a brush called a lophophore. So if you've got lots of silicate mud floating around in the water, lots of silicate clay, that lophophore, which is kind of like a curly mustache, is gonna get clogged up with mud and you can't feed. But if you've got really quiet, low sedimentation conditions with just a bit of carbonate mud raining down, that's a really nice location for a brachiopod to sit and filter little particles out of the seawater. And that's probably why we don't see as many brachiopods up here in the area where it's higher energy and in the area where we've got the silicate clay muds. And we can see that these layers repeat over this little bit of the stratigraphy we've got. So these changes must have been happening on semi-regular cycles for a long time period, for thousands and thousands or maybe millions of years. What might have been causing these changes? We don't know if these the changes we're seeing are in this one location or if they're across the whole region or even across the whole planet. So one thing we can do is compare that to rocks around the region. And what we do see is that there are these cycles in other rocks around Oxfordshire. We can compare them to the same age rocks that we find across say the rest of the UK and the rest of Europe. And we do find that quite often there are sequences like this. When I was in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, I looked at middle Jurassic limestones and even there I saw sequences like this. So we can say, based on that evidence, that whatever these changes were, it was a combination of local factors and then something that was affecting an entire ocean, the entire Tethys Ocean, and so probably it was a global event. There's a couple of different things that can cause environmental changes on that scale, on a global scale, with this kind of cyclic nature. It could be tectonics, changing of the continental plate, positions of the continental plates, as land gets lifted up and lowered down and coastlines retreat and advance. Or it could be changes in the climate cycles driven by changes in the Earth's orbit, what we call Milankovitch cycles, which we could talk about another time. But what we see is that these cycles are represented throughout the Middle Jurassic and even in the Early Jurassic across the whole world, wherever you get carbonate sequences. So here we can see we've got some more coral, some little tubes that might be worm tubes or coral and then this curved ribbed imprint, which could be from an ammonite. If we go over here, we can see there's another curved ribbed imprint that has this little nugget inside it, little umbo, and this is a scallop shell. So there's more evidence that we are, are actually in a marine environment. And we can see that this cavity there lined with crystal, that hole, that's a brachiopod shell. So when brachiopods die, the shell seals shut and crystals can grow inside it, it's buried. Brachiopods are also a marine-only organism, so there's more evidence that we're in a marine environment. You can never have too much evidence when it comes to describing your environment. If we look under here, we can see the, the spaces where the coral used to be. So the reason there's no actual coral there in just the spaces is because coral's made of a mineral called aragonite, and aragonite is unstable. So once the organism dies, it can't maintain the aragonite anymore. And as it gets, as the sediment gets buried, it undergoes a process called diagenesis. And the aragonite changes into calcite, which is a more stable form. And, and in doing so, 
the shell of the coral dissolves and then re-precipitates. And that's probably what a lot of this carbonate cement is. Creatures like the brachiopod though, that we saw earlier, have a calcite shell. So they preserve really nicely. So here we can see there's a rubbly, underside of the rubbly layer, and there's lots of burrows in here. So there were lots of things living within the sediment. So it's probably nice and oxygenated. And if we look here in the clay rich layer, we can just see how, how different that is. It still just turns to mud. So that darker clay is, cut, is uh, an iron oxyhydroxide called gertite. So to find out how localized this environment is, what we can do is go along strike the direction of outcrop that we've got and see if it looks the same all the way along. So have a little bet with yourself. Do you think it's going to change at all? Or do you think over this exposure, we're going to see exactly the same things over and over again? Let's go and find out. probably noticed there from Sarah's expert cinematography and filming that the rocks have changed a little bit. We don't have the same sequence of layers as we did over there. We've got this big thick rubbly and blocky layer and then a recessed rubbly clay layer and then another blocky layer up there and some more blocky layers down there. So we're within the same rock unit where we've got the same lithologies and types of rocks but somehow they've changed. But we don't actually know why here. You notice that there was a, a part that was overgrown with lots of mud coming down. Look, that's the kind of place where you could expect to find a fault. So maybe the rocks have shifted relative to each other and we're seeing a different part of the stratigraphy. Or maybe this is an actual localized change. Within modern reef systems, you do get quite drastic changes within the same reef area. We've still got the same kind of lithology, the same rubbly layer, clay layer, oysters, this layer here that's got the brachiopods in it. We've also got something quite new and interesting. And then we've got this mound here with all of these layers in it. And this is a part, an original part of the reef that survived. So whereas the rest of this part of the reef has been smashed up and covered in all of this rubble, which has the special name of Talus, sounds like a character from Lord of the Rings. It's just a fancy way of saying rubble made out of bits of coral and shells and stuff. We've got this laminated rock called a stromatolite. And this particular stromatolite was probably made by algae and bacteria. While a stromatolite is a, a finely laid rock, not all of them are made by living organisms. And we can tell this is probably made by living organisms because when we zoom in, you'll notice that some of these lumps and bumps tilt over. And if this was a, an abiotic, if this was just mud piling up, once things go over about 30 degrees, they tend to fall over. So that's why sand dunes all tend to have the same kind of slope on them. But here, the lumps and bumps and bulbs and layers will tilt almost over back on themselves. And that means they're being held up together by something quite sticky. And the best contender for that is EPS, extracellular polyrimic substance, or as we more commonly refer to it, snot. So this means that there's probably been another change in the environment. So animals would normally eat all this bacteria and algae before it could build up like this. The fact it hasn't here means that the environment must have changed so that animals couldn't live in it very easily unless they were spe specialized organisms. And we do see that mixed in with the algae stomatolite, we've got worm tubes and oysters, but not much else. And those kind of worms and oysters are really good at surviving rapidly changing environmental conditions. So maybe there wasn't enough oxygen for bigger animals. Maybe it's the salinity, it was getting too salty and, or too fresh. Maybe it's the pH was changing or it was too warm. It might have been a little lagoon. We don't know for sure. What we can see though is that these remnants of this stromatolite layer go all along. So there was probably a big patch reef here made entirely out of stromatolites, oysters and worm tubes. And there's some excellent laminations in there. And we can see it was growing on top of this hard knobbly stuff. And this is iron stone. And the Jurassic, in Europe especially, is really important for iron production. Because of these shallow tropical seas with with, that were near rivers, but weren't getting drowned by plastic sediments, by sand and clay, so all of the iron could build up. Here's something I found that's really, really cool and tells us about the things that were living here and the environmental conditions all in one go. So it's this spiral shape, and it's called a Steinkern. 
and that's where a shell has been infilled with mud, but then the shell has been dissolved away. And normally that happens millions of years after burial. But here, we can see that the steinkerns formed, the shell has dissolved away, and then it's been colonized by worms and oysters, which means that it must have dissolved fairly soon after it was buried and then been brought back to the surface where it could be colonized. So this is actually from the inside of a long snail shell called a turritellid snail. And snail shells like coral are made of aragonite. So it tells us that aragonite was very unstable in the chemical conditions that were present on the sediment surface and then just under the sediment surface. So it's no wonder that there's no coral actually left here anymore. It was probably all dissolved pretty soon after burial. Thanks very much for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed looking around the tropical reefs of Jurassic Oxford. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment and share it with your friends. I'd love it if you subscribed as well so you didn't miss out on any of the future videos where I talk about rocks and fossils and other cool earth science and stuff. So until next time, stay safe, take care. See you later. Bye. So until next time, Take care. Oh, what am I saying? Bye! <laughs> oh, oh, I can't think of a witty catchphrase. Never mind. So until next time, take care. Have a good time. Look, have a good time. Have a good time! <laughs> have a good time. <laughs> you can like this face. Should I stop now or are you gonna carry on moving? I'm stopping.